Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Very, very much. Thank you. I'd like to welcome you to the services tonight. We have some guests with us all the way from Bastrop. Very glad to have them here with us. And I trust that the rest of you likewise will enjoy the services to the honor and glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. At this time I want to ask Brother Matt to come. He's going to be bringing the presentation of his field. He's going to be telling us a little bit about their recent trip that they took over to Kurdistan. And I believe that April is going to give a testimony also. And so I'm going to dismiss the choir, or pardon me, the orchestra players to go out there so they can see him rather than have to look at his back all of the time. And we will have this before we sing another song. God bless you, Brother Matt. Well, if I had to pick, I'd stare at the back of my head as opposed to the front of my face. That's a lot better to look at. Well, we've, uh, we've really enjoyed this week. I do want to get right into a couple of things. Thank you, church, so much. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, maybe, when my wife and I took our survey trip back in July, this church... Uh, helped us to get there in a tremendous fashion and I want you to remember that and to think about that when you watch this video that the faces that you see and the words that are said on there were made possible in part by this church by Trinity Baptist Church in Austin Texas you had a part in getting us to that field you had a part in us being over there and getting a ministry set to be able to go and minister to the Kurdish people, you have already reached out to the Kurdish people with what you've done. And we thank you so much for your heart, for your vision to see people saved. Uh, my wife and I went over there and we spent a little bit less than a month in Kurdistan, which is in northern Iraq. If you're not familiar with the area, uh, if you look on a map and you'll find Iraq, you'll find Baghdad, then you'll find Mosul, which is just up from there. We're a couple of hours north of Mosul, just, uh, just below the Turkish border. We're bordered by Syria and Iran and Turkey. Our major border is there with Turkey. Uh, our, first, our first day, it was a long flight. It's a long flight to get there. The best, the best flight we have ever had in our life was a foreign airline. I'm not kidding you. That was the best flight ever. The worst was American Airlines. Oh man, if you've got to fly, avoid them at all costs. Avoid at all costs. But uh, we flew Qatar Airways and I'm telling you, if, we, if you come over and visit us, we will tell you which airlines to fly. It's, it's, it's great. I'm, I'm telling you it is. And you laugh when I say come and visit us, but we're serious when, about when we get over there. We want people to come and see the work. When you invest in something, you, you ought to come and, and see that. And don't be frightened. Don't be scared. Crazy things happen everywhere. Where crazy things happen in Austin. So if crazy things are going to ha happen anyway, let's just enjoy the life that God has given us and live it as abundantly as we can. That's our philosophy going to the field. But we, uh, the, it, was, it was a long flight. and We finally got over there our first day. Our first day in Kurdistan. Very first day there. My wife lost her passport. We, we lost our luggage. She passed out. We're still on our first day. We haven't finished the first day. We got separated in two different taxis for two hours in Iraq. <laughs> all on the first. So you know what we did is God knew we needed to get all of that out of, out of the way the first day. The rest of the trip was just perfect. It was seamless. <laughs> But uh, through, through those events happening, God brought us into contact with, with an Arab family from Baghdad. And we spent the entire day with them, got separated in taxis with them, but, but eventually found each other again. Thank God. We found each other again. And we're still in contact with those people. We're able to, uh, through some different means, we're able to witness and to present a testimony for the gospel of Christ to these people. You, Trinity Baptist Church of Austin, Texas, had a part in that. Not in her passing out, but in us being able to get the God. <laughs> that was all on the husband there. But in being able to show these people the gospel. It's, I, I can't begin, I can't begin to tell you. Honestly, I can't begin to tell you what it was like. Our first day, we should have rested. We should, we should have rested. But we couldn't help it. We finally got to be with our people. I mean, this was it. We got to be with our people and we couldn't wait. As soon as we got to, to the place we were staying, we dropped our stuff off, we changed our clothes and we headed out. I just, I couldn't wait. I wanted to talk to people. I wanted to see them. I wanted to meet them. I wanted to hear the language. I just, I just wanted to be around my people. And you helped to make that possible. 
I loved the Kurdish people before we ever went to Kurdistan. But when it was in Kurdistan is when I fell in love with the people that God has for us. And I cannot begin to put into words to you, church, what you did in helping us to get over there and to, to if you could just see those people. And I hope when you watch this, that you, what you don't see is just Muslims. It's easy to do that as Americans. We watch the news and we just see terrorists. We see Muslim, we think terrorists. When you see this, I beg you, see these people, not as Muslims, not as Kurds, but as souls that need Jesus Christ. Because that's what they are. And politics are not going to fix their problems. Politics haven't fixed our problems. It is only going to be fixed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can repair anything in this country and in that country. We'll never bring peace to the world, but we can bring the peace that God brings to the world. And that's what we're trying to bring to Kurdistan. We want to start there, what you have here. That's our goal. Our goal is to start this there, so that on Sunday they have a place they can come and hear the gospel, so that they can hear music, they can hear singing, so that they can receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. I'm going to stop because I need to stop. We need to be mindful of time. But as you watch this, I beg you, watch these people and just remember that these are souls for whom Christ died. He loved them just like he loves you and he wants to see them saved. Um, Pastor asked me to give a quick word of testimony, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, oh boy, we shouldn't have watched the video right before this. I hope you saw people, like my husband said, and not just Muslims. Because that's what we saw when we were over there. And uh, we're so blessed to get to go to the Kurdish people. But um, <clears throat> I was called to missions when I was in this church, in the old building, um, as an 11-year-old girl. <clears throat> and uh, I don't remember much about the missions conference, but I remember laying awake at night and wondering, what is this? I knew that God was saying, you're supposed to be a missionary, but I didn't know he could call a girl. <laughs> and I was, uh, I was confused about it. Last night at the missions conference, I approached Brother Horn, who's a missionary to Bolivia, and I just said, um, can God call an 11-year-old girl to the mission field? And uh, he just kneeled down in front of me and looked me in the eye, and he said, God's calling you. And peace just flooded my heart. And I've known since that day <clears throat> that I was supposed to be a missionary. Um, as a teenager, I strayed from the Lord quite a bit, actually. And uh, uh, long story short, once I came back to God, the first thing he did was remind me of my call. And I uh, went to Bible college, and um, through all that time of being single, my question was, well, I'm still single, um, so how is this going to come to fruition? And uh, meeting Matt finally answered the question of who, the people group that God's called me to love. And uh, so we're so excited about going to the Kurdish people. And uh, the survey trip over there was amazing. I'm going to tell you briefly about three people that I met over there. Uh, they were all in the video, actually. <laughs> the, first the first one's name is Zainab. She's a mother who was insistent that I come back and tell Americans that not all Muslims are terrorists and that we love Christians and we love Jews and she went through the whole list and she was adamant about that and she is concerned about her daughter and her daughter being interested in the wrong things and going down a wrong path so she's a mother just like a mother here concerned about her 16 year old daughter the second person that I met was Sana her 16 year old daughter Sana's favorite movie is Twilight <laughs> Sana's favorite band is a boy band she's just like the teenagers here she's um, she has worldly interests and she just needs the Lord okay and the third lady I can't pronounce her name but she's about my age and a mother and she crying said to me that she reads the Quran every morning that she loves Allah she described him as such a personal God, but he's not a personal God. <clears throat> so the, what I want to bring out about her is that, um, you know, she is just like everyone in the world that craves a personal Savior. So that's what we're going to do is go to Kurdistan and teach them that um, there's a God that they can know. There's a God that they can love and know personally. So uh, that's what I want to tell you tonight. Well, I'm going to ask Matt and April to come up, and you guys might have some questions that you'd like to ask them. 
If so, why well, feel free to ask them whether or not they're able to answer them. Maybe another problem. Uh, come over this way a little bit more, if you would. And uh, if you have a question, does anyone have a question that you'd like to ask them about their trip, about their goals, about their field of service? Uh, any questions at all? Brother Brantley. So you've identified the country, and you've already got an area in the country that you have. We want to start a church in every city we went to. There was not one city we went to that didn't have a reason we should go to that one. The, the town that we believe God would have us be in, at least for the first couple of terms we're there, is called Erbil. It's called Erbil. It's the main city in Iraqi Kurdistan. It's the largest city in Iraqi Kurdistan. We believe that's the city that, we'll, that we will most likely start out in. Is that the city your plane landed in? Yes, sir. That's the city we flew into and... All of those events occurred that first day. Okay. <laughs> Good city to go to. Yeah. Is that the city you were telling me that is ancient Nineveh? No, that's Mosul. Mosul, Mosul. that's right. I'm sorry, I remember that. That is Mosul. <laughs> okay, but it's close by anyway. A couple of hours. It's not very far. It's a dangerous place. As dangerous now as it, as it was for, for Jonah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. For Jonah. That but they not. had revival. Yes. And got right with God. <clears throat> Uh, are there any other questions? Anyone have a question you'd like to ask? Uh, okay, Richard. Is, is there a miracle story in that area? Or what are y'all about to There are. Uh, there's not very many. We didn't see a single one uh, while we were there. We had a base there during Operation Iraqi Freedom when we pulled the soldiers out. Uh, we weren't required to take all the soldiers out of Kurdistan. Kurdistan is very friendly towards the United States. But we do not expect protection from, nor did we see any American soldiers while we were there. But they are very friendly towards the United States. The Kurdish people, very friendly to the U.S. This is Brother Sam from Faith Baptist Church down in Bastrop. Brother Sam has a question. I guess what I'm interested in knowing is the plan of attack, for the say. <laughs> are, are people, uh, like you guys, going over there and converting people into Christianity or uh, giving them the gospel and, and seeing them come to the Lord Jesus Christ before we get a church built? Or do we want a church first and then do that? Or Yes and yes and yes. We want it all at the same time. I want it all. I don't want just. I want it all. I think God can do it for. Us. I think He can give it all to us. We do serve a great God. That's right. But you're right. There does need to be a plan. And what we plan on doing is there are some some brethren there that are saved. That are Christians. They've not been. They've not had the same opportunity to be taught doctrine the way we have here and in our independent Baptist churches. And our hope and our prayer is through an Iraqi gentleman to get some of those men together that are willing, teach them, here's what you are as a Christian, as an independent Baptist, here's what we believe. This is what is right according to the scripture and establish the first Baptist church. And then from there, we plan to turn that church over to a national pastor and then we will go and start another one. While that is going on, we plan to go into witness. Going door to door is not quite something that you can do. Preaching on the street is not the most advisable thing to do. But we are able to engage people in conversation. We are able to talk about the Lord and our beliefs. And to be, you can be wise in the way you witness, but it can be done. It can be done. We, we believe wholeheartedly this, it can be done. And God wants it done. I would like to add, if I may, that uh, soul winning and leading someone to Christ along with having church goes hand in hand together, yeah. if you yeah. want my opinion. I mean, if where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'll be in their midst. Uh, you, you could ha I have, uh, personally, if you want my advice... You can have church yourselves in your own home on Sunday morning and invite somebody to come and be in church with you and sing a song and read the scripture and, and have something from the Word of God. I believe uh, personally that it's, it's um, not the, the uh, quantity of the number that you have there but it's the power of Jesus Christ our Lord that makes the difference. In fact, 
I feel personally that in our American churches, we have misunderstood what spirituality really is. We have come to the point where we think big is spiritual and little is, I wonder what he did to deserve little. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, hey, uh, talk to the disciples. What did Paul do to deserve to be decapitated there at the Mamertine prison area in the city of Rome? Uh, I think that we have forgotten that the power is of God Almighty. Amen. It is not us. It is not fixtures. It is not church building so much. If, if Paul could lead Lydia to the Lord out by the riverside uh, there in Philippi and my word go to jail and have the whole thing quaked yeah. apart before it was said and done that night, what can God's power do today? I mean, it's the same God yeah. yesterday, today, and forever. And I do believe we're living in the last days, uh, but I believe we serve the same God yeah. if we're willing to go to the extent that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to, uh, but if not, uh, if we're willing to go to the extent that Daniel went to, uh, and that meant the lion's den for him, and I submit for your consideration, he didn't know those lions were going to be friendly uh, to him uh, when he went into the lion's den, but he was going anyway because he was going to take his stand for God. Yeah. Uh, so to me, uh, you got the, the not either or, but the both and yep. uh, type situation Everything. is my humble addition to the question. Did you have a question, Justin? Yes, uh, I just wanted to ask you about cost of living and then also um, total expense as far as having to get over to uh, there just to ship whatever you're going to ship and everything else like that. And if you can discuss that for the cost of living is high, especially for a Westerner, it's very high. To rent, say, a, um, about a 900 square foot one bedroom would run you anywhere from twenty-five dollars to $3,500 a month. And that's prior to bills and things like that. Now that's not necessarily for a local there, but as a foreigner, that's just the, that's just the way of it. You, you're going to pay more. Um, as far as shipping things over there, we will, we will probably not bring a whole lot with us from here over there. We'll start fairly fresh there. I will bring clothes. We, we want to go clothed and in our right minds, as the scripture said. So we'll bring, we'll bring some clothes with us. But we don't plan to ship uh, a whole lot over. Uh, we think that the area is... We, we want to be as biblical as possible and live as close as we can within reason to the people that we're ministering to. Right? And, and showing up with everything that you have to the United States is not conducive to, to witnessing and, and winning people to Christ. I mean, I don't want to I don't want to go around with holes in my clothes and be a poor testimony, but we also don't want to come over as the Westerners who are coming to Americanize you because that's not our goal. We're not there to make Americans. We're just there to show people the gospel of Christ. So that's that's our goal. It is very expensive. It's very expensive to live there. I, he asked uh, about the shipping charges. What what are the airline tickets to go over there? Do you it was about 5000 for both of us to go. Um, it, was, it was about $5,000. <laughs> we, we did find some tickets that were a little bit... We've got to take another trip. So we found some that were a little cheaper. It's going to run us about $3,800, $4,000 to go back again. So they're, they're not cheap. But there are more expensive. We found some tickets to go there that were twelve thousand dollars a person. Uh, we did not go with those tickets. <laughs> just so you know, we, we didn't go that direction. I understand. Uh, if you have any questions you want to direct to April, why go ahead and do so. Brother Arnuk has a question. Would you stand, brother, and speak up so they can hear? Uh, usually, for the Arab countries, you cannot go as missionary. Right? Correct. So uh, you don't proclaim to the government that you're a missionary. Mm -hmm. So you have some other position that you enter the country there. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Our plan. Yes. You don't need to tell him. He is absolutely right. You cannot go and you know yeah. hold up a sign that says. I understand. But one yes. That I knew before, and I know about them later. They went there. Except to Lebanon, but for example, to 
any other Arab country, Islamic country, you need to go like a teacher, yes. or nurse, or doctor, or something else. Then you do your job and you do your ministry. Yes. That he is he is a hundred percent correct. There's a good there's a tremendous brother named Stephen Trell who is planning on going to Baghdad. He's in the country of Jordan right now in language training, him and his children, and his wife. And he has contacted a business, it is a business, it's not a ministry, it's a business, that will assist foreigners in getting into Kurdistan. Now this may, if this is the way we can get in, this would be the best, I, I can't imagine a better way. If God allows this, this is, I would I'd absolutely love it. But if you volunteer pro bono, four hours a week, to teach English to Kurdish people at no charge to them, they will allow you a visa to stay in the country indefinitely. You cannot, I mean, you can't buy that. That's absolute gold. If, if God wills that we're able to do that, we will be all over that. And, man, four hours a week in exchange for spreading the gospel, as much as we want, I'll take it. That's a bargain as far as I'm concerned. Now, for those of you who are interested, Brother Arnuk is from Syria and is in Austin to try to do a ministry among Muslim people, for, for which I praise the Lord. And I was thinking to myself in your question, Brother, that uh, I think we all know that the, the Islamic population is increasing tremendously and many converts are being made to Islam. Yeah. But most of the converts are made through people who have come here to live in the country, as it were. And uh, that's how the converts are being made. They're not being made by the Imans. Uh, am I saying that Imams. correctly? Uh, so to speak, uh, Imans, Imans, whatever you say it. Uh, they're not being converted in that way as much as they are by people who are just here living and uh, have that as their agenda, I, yes, sir. I feel like. Anyway, all right, anybody else have a question that you'd like to ask him? Brother Jeff, way in the back, stand, brother, and speak up. It's a long way up here. Have you used tracks? Are you able to hand out tracks to people? They've got to be in the language first. Uh, most people, about 40 and over, that are Kurdish do speak Arabic because Arabic was forcibly taught in schools. Saddam Hussein required it. Uh, the majority of the country, about 50% of that country is under the age of 25 and when they ceased having Arabic required as a spoken language they didn't learn it and they didn't learn English either so a majority of the country is Kurdish speaking only so what we'll need to do is get with some of these brethren that are already Christians and or ourselves once we learn the language and we'll have to put a lot of this material together in order to get those and pass those out so yes we do have plans to do that but those are not in place at the moment but yes sir we, we are planning to do that I have a question. Uh, okay, Elliot, go ahead. In terms of the support that you need, how much that you currently have? We're in the very beginning stages of deputation. Um, we did part-time uh, just going on weekends, traveling to churches from September to January. In January, we stepped out, and we are now full-time. Uh, my plan, my goal, our, our prayer is, and it's idealistic, but I think we have an idealistic God, and I think He can do anything He wants, and our prayer is one year from March to be done with everything, matters settled, things taken care of, we are on the plane, and we are in our country with our people, where we belong. I think that um, most people here at Trinity would consider April kind of like one of our own, and uh, I know I do. And I sure want to be involved in their ministry over there. And I'm a great traveler. I've been known to leave the country at one time before. Um, so don't be surprised if I show up some, someday over there. Don't be surprised if yes, I don't show right. up either. And when it comes sundown, I have to be home. You understand? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I just want to Expedited say, flight. I wanted to ask April. April, uh, I looked at the fruits there at the market on the video. And I may be wrong. Were those Bing cherries? Yes. I oh, thought they were Bing cherries. They're the best Bing cherries you've ever tasted. <laughs> I wanted some of them. I wanted to reach out and get some of them. Did you bring us some? Well, no, they don't transport very well. We did buy like 10 we bought, what, how much should we Probably buy? Probably not 10 kilos, 10 but about... 10 kilos and ate them the whole time we were there. Yeah. Okay, now are you, you go to, are you going to go to the market and shop like the ladies do over there? I will not be allowed to go by myself to the market. 
and in their culture you have to have a male accompanying you or, or go in a group of women. So until I make acquaintances, um, he'll have to go with me everywhere. But, <laughs> so, but you do go. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, he has to go with you in a taxi everywhere. <laughs> in a taxi would be good. Yeah. Apparently two different taxis sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> ah, yeah okay. Uh, so you're going to the market to buy the food like the people there buy the food, Yes, right? and they also ha they do have grocery store equivalents that are pretty good. So I'll probably buy my meat if I can at the grocery store and probably everything else at the market. You know, spices and fruits and vegetables will probably be at the market. Okay, I got a question. You say they charge the foreigners extra money on rent. They see Americans coming with their loaded pocketbooks, mm -hmm. I guess, and saying, what about at the market? Do you pay the same price as the other people pay for the bean cherries, or do you pay some barter? Yeah, it's a bartering system, and so if I'm tenacious enough, I can probably get it down to the price that the people pay. So. <laughs> Hang in there. Go <laughs> take Marcia with you. <laughs> I mean, don't take much with you. Right? <laughs> don't do that. All right. Does anybody else have a question like to ask them? Right quick like. O okay. Uh, Brother Arnuk, I think your hand was up first. Just one other question. Do you present the gospel in Arabic or in Kurdish? Once we learn Kurdish, we will present it to them in Kurdish. For the time being, um, English is, is how we will communicate. Not many of them speak English. Some do. Those that do speak it generally very well. Those that don't speak it not at all. So our first priority when we get there is learn the language. That is our first priority. Yes, sir. <laughs> and then I think I saw Brother Sam stand up again. I guess for April, uh, I've noticed we have several young people here today, tonight, and uh, I was wondering if you had any advice for them if they feel the call to missions or, or any other call. Uh, what advice would you give them to, to, to help them? I would say, and this sounds uh, simple and maybe not that spiritual, but follow God one step at a time because there, there are times, I mean, I was, the Lord told me I was supposed to be a missionary when I was 11. There were times in between, didn't look like it was going to happen unless I was a single missionary and I had no calling from him, I felt. And so, just like anything else in the Christian life, if you follow one step at a time, you don't try to look too far ahead because he already has that then you'll end up where God wants you to be, you know. And obviously a personal relationship with God every day will help you to follow him one step at a time. So. Okay, if you have uh, Bernice. In respect to language school, do you already have a school that teaches um, English to whatever? And I, don't you have some training already, Matt, in, in their language? In Arabic, not in Kurdish. There's only two places that I know of. That doesn't mean that that's all there is. There's only two that I know of in the U.S. that teach Kurdish, which is a University of Arizona and then University of Tennessee. Okay, so you will do some here before No, we will do it there. We'll do it all there. We are going to be fully immersed in everything. We'll learn the language uh, when we get there. And are guys taught together as has been invited? We hope so. We hope so, but what, whatever we need to do is, is what we'll do on that. We would like to be, we'd love to have an outreach in the university because with the large youth culture there, that is a prime place to be able to minister because their minds are most open when they're there at the university. They're the furthest away from Islam when they're at the university, the furthest away. And we'd love to be able to have a ministry to those young people while we're learning the language. I mean, nothing's better than, hey, teach me what this means in Kurdish. And I got a Bible right there. I mean, there's so many opportunities learn through learning the language that we can reach out to people. That's so we will learn the language when we get there. How long do I think it'll take? I don't think it'll take as long as, as people look at Arabic and say, oh my goodness, I can never learn that. It's, it's a mindset. When I was a young man, we, we learned Navajo to speak Navajo on the reservation. And Navajo was far more difficult a language, in my opinion, than Arabic. Arabic is beautiful. And the way that it flows, uh, I believe if you want to learn it, God is able to give you the ability to learn it as quick as He wants you to learn it. So I'd like to be able to be preaching fluently, and this is idealistic, I'd like to be preaching fluently in the language, being able to write our material by the time the first term is over. That's, that's my goal, to be able to be fluent, uh, preaching, teaching, witnessing, speaking, everything in Sarani.
Okay, I'm going to cut the question and answer session off right there and ask Lily to come. I've asked her to sing the song, My Heavenly Father Watches Over Me. And the reason I wanted this song is because whether it's in Kurdistan, where let's face it, we often think of those parts of the world as warring peoples, dangerous things, uh, probably things that we don't see coming up, but it's the same Heavenly Father watching over them there as it is watching over us here. And I am reminded that one of the missionaries of times gone by uh, said that to be in the will of God in the most dangerous place on earth was safer than being out of the will of God at the safest place on earth. So my Heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God wherever I may be upon the land or on a rolling sea for come what may if you would to the book of Romans chapter 10 and join me in standing I'm gonna read quickly I am aware of the time and I know Saturdays are a long day and we've got Sunday tomorrow so I promise you I'll be quick if you'll listen I'll preach um, Miss Haley already told me how the service needs to go tonight she said uh, no crying a little yelling and then preaching and that would be just fine so that's what we'll try to do Romans chapter 10 Romans chapter 10 I want you to look at verse uh, number 11 Romans 10 and verse number 11 it says this for the scripture saith whosoever believeth on him him being Jesus Christ shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall 
shall be saved. The color of the skin doesn't matter. The religion of your ethnicity doesn't matter. Where you come from, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, it doesn't matter. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Verse number 14. How then shall they call upon him, call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Father, we come before you tonight. Thank you for this crowd of people that are here. I pray that you would bless the message, that you would bless them for being here, Father, that you would give them something from your word that is encouraging, that, that exhorts. Father, I want to just encourage the brethren tonight before we go home. I pray you would bless the message in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please keep your finger here. We're going to move quick. Keep your finger here or your ribbon and flip over to Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, which is a tremendous cross-reference to this passage. If I could title this, this brief message, I would title it this, When it comes to faith promise, when it comes to giving, we are asking the wrong question. When it comes to giving, when it comes to faith promise, we are asking the wrong question. Look in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse number 7. A tremendous passage here. Now, the, the context here is talking about the second advent. This is talking about the second coming of the Lord. But I want you to think about Romans as we read this and apply it to you as Trinity Baptist Church in Austin. Verse number 7, Isaiah 52, 7 says this. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice. With the voice together shall they sing. For they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. And here's what they're singing about in verse 9. Break forth into joy. Sing together, ye waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord hath comforted his people. He hath redeemed Jerusalem. Verse number 10. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Those are incredible words. Amazing passage right there. Brother Matt, that is Old Testament. How does that apply to me? First, just take that out of your mind. Just take that out. This is Old Testament. I want you to wipe it away. Wipe it away. Tonight, I want you to look at these passages as they apply to Trinity Baptist Church in Austin, Texas. Look in verse number 7 and here is the question we always ask with faith, faith promise. Always we ask this. Pastor, why should I give? Why should I give? And I submit to you, church, that tonight, that's the wrong question. That is the wrong question to ask when it comes to giving and when it comes to faith promise. Now, I'm going to hit faith promise tonight, but I want to say this briefly. If you are a member of Trinity Baptist Church in Austin, Texas, you should be involved in giving to the local ministry of this church through your tithing. You need to be involved in that. Do you enjoy the food? You should be involved. If you enjoy the music, you should be involved. Do you enjoy the preaching? You should be involved. Do you enjoy the lights and the central heat and air? You should be involved. Do you enjoy the fact you have this building? You should be involved. So the question is not, why should we be involved? Well, it's apparent all around us, isn't it? That why we should be involved. Look at this verse number 7. I want to show you something. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good. That is just a neat phrase. Good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. I submit to you, church, that applicably in this passage it's talking about preachers and missionaries and evangelists. God's saying how good is it? How beautiful is it these people that go out and publish my word, publish salvation tell people about Jesus Christ how beautiful is that? But is that, is that all? Is that according to Romans it said how shall they hear without a preacher and how shall these publishers preach unless they be sent? 
See, Brother Matt, where's the sender in this passage? Verse number 8. I submit to you, verse number 8 is an application. Thy watchman. That is Trinity Baptist Church of Austin, Texas. You, church, are the watchman for Brother Summerdorf as he goes out from church to church to church and publishes the message of salvation. Verse number 8. Thy watchman shall lift up the voice with the voice together shall they sing. So can he do it alone? According to the scripture, the watchman must lift up the voice with the publisher of salvation. The publisher cannot publish without the watchman together with the publisher. See, so Brother Matt, br bring it closer. Okay, this afternoon, you know what we did? We published. We published and somebody got saved. You know why? Because the watchman gathered together and published salvation and God said it was beautiful. And God said it was wonderful. But we needed a publisher of salvation and we needed watchmen to sing together with them. They worked together in harmony. They worked together in harmony. Church, uh, let me tell you this. All the messages this week, nobody has guilted you into giving. Let me, let's be real. For just, can I be real for just a minute? Not one message has guilted you into giving, if you'll be honest with yourself. Not a single time that Pastor Brother Burkholder got up here and turned on this overhead, not one time in all of his A's that he gave, did he guilt anybody into giving. I don't believe in guilt giving. I believe in grace giving. And if I get a hold of the grace that was given to me, I don't have to be guilted into giving. I will give, not because why should I give, but because of what was given to me. The question that we're asking is the wrong question. When you think of faith promise, when you think of missions, when you think of souls, the question is not, why should I? The question is, what will I do with what has been given to me? That is the question for the church. Not, will I give? That shouldn't even be a question. Not, why should I give? That shouldn't even be a question. The question for every one of you, would tomorrow, when you have that piece of paper, when you hold up and look at that piece of paper, and you decide what you are going to do, what you're going to do, not if you're going to, not why should I give, but what will I do with all that God has given me? That's the question when you think of faith promise. Without that, this is, this is really neat. Look in verse number 10, Isaiah 52, 10. Look what it says here. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm. I was telling my wife this. That, that gives me the picture of God looking over the earth or even into the bowels of hell. And as, as a kid, you know when you were a kid, everybody compared muscles. You ever do that? As a kid, you're like, and you stuck your finger back here and you kind of pushed it up hoping nobody saw. You were comparing, you were bearing your arm. I get the picture when this word is published and the watchmen are together with the publisher and the word of salvation is going out that God is bearing his holy arm in the face of this devil, in the face of all hell saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. They're not asking why. They're not, why do they have to do for me? They're asking what it is they can do for me. And he bears his holy arm in their face. You know that the devil, Lucifer, right now stands before God accusing us to God. He's the accuser of the brethren. And every time that the publisher publishes salvation and the watchmen sing together with the publisher, God bears his holy arm. And look what it says. In the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. But not without the watchmen singing together with the publisher. Not without them together. It's not why faith promise, it's what can I do with what has been given to me. Brother Matt, what's been given to me? Well, I'll tell you what's been given to me is Matt Haynes. I've got a Bible in my language because somebody gave. I have a church I can go to because somebody gave. I heard the gospel from a preacher because somebody gave. I got to go to my people where I belong because somebody gave. One day my people will have a Bible in their language because somebody gave. So the question for me, Matt Haynes, is not why should I give, but God, what shall I do that you have given to me? It's more than your pocketbook. It's more than your money. It is about the salvation of souls and the glorifying of our Father which is in heaven. 
Let me just make this statement in. I will be through tomorrow and go to sleep tonight. You're going to be tired. And we're all tired. Saturdays are a long day and Sundays are a long day. We're going to be tired. You're going to get up in the morning and the first thing is, you're going to think, I don't like the way that smells. That just annoyed me all night long that he just sat there and yelled the whole time. And instead of listening to the message, we will make excuses for not doing what we heard because we didn't like the skinny little feller that was yelling it. If the publisher is not publishing, God is not bearing that arm and the salvation is not going out to the ends of the earth. The question church, Trinity Baptist Church of Austin, Texas, the question before you is not why should I give? It's the wrong question. The question for you tonight, church, is what will I do with all that God has done for me? Pastor. Let's bow our heads as we stand, please, and are in a spirit of prayer. We certainly have important business before us in this faith promise offering and stewardship before the Lord. Tomorrow we'll start taking up the sheets at the end of the morning church service and continue that through the following Sunday night service. And I trust that you might at this particular time be asking the Lord, praying to the Lord, seeking God's counsel, seeking God's guidance in what the Lord would have you to do and what part you can play in the evangelization of the world, worldwide, not just here, but worldwide. And so as we are in this spirit of prayer, if God is speaking to your heart and you'd like to come to the altar and pray about this faith promise, I challenge you to at least pray about it. Ask the Lord about it. And I'll ask Brother Justin to sing a verse of invitation for us as we're in this spirit of prayer. May God bless you to know and do His will. Our Father in heaven, I thank you for thy great love. And I pray, O Lord God, that thou would speak to our hearts as only you can now in a very special way. In Jesus' name, in the spirit of prayer, as our brother sings. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, oh, we would just be the clay. I am the clay. These are coming, are there others? Is God speaking in your heart? Would you join these and pray and ask the Lord what he has for you? Wow.